Good morning, everybody. Hope you've had a nice uh, day so far uh, at the Infarin Conference. Uh, delight to have everybody here for our session over the next uh, 75 minutes or so. To kick us off, as uh, I like to do in my class sessions, one is I like to play music before my class. I think it's a great way to break the ice a little bit and get people talking and get them a little bit uh, energized. So uh, I would recommend that. Uh, but always make sure your children are part of building the playlist. Otherwise, you tend to put the things on there that you like to hear and maybe not what the students like to hear. Uh, something else I like to do early in my class sessions is to get everybody to introduce themselves. So I want you guys to take two minutes, introduce yourself to a neighbor who you've not met or know, real quickly. So just lean over, talk to somebody who you do not know. It's the first part of the semester to break ice with students who uh, don't know each other, uh, particularly for your freshmen and sophomores. But even I found in upper level classes where I have a mix of students from different schools, uh, they don't know each other. And sometimes we assume that too much, even as juniors and seniors, that they know everybody. So it's a great way to do that. You know, two or three times your first couple of class sessions to make everyone feel at home. And particularly if you've got international exchange students who are here for the semester or whatever, it's a really good way to get them to, to meet some of their classmates as part of the program. Uh, real quick, here's who's attending today. We have a great number of uh, folks signed up for it. I'll give props to CAST, but I guess that's a little bit unfair since they are the biggest uh, school <laughs> on campus. Uh, but so far, they lead the way at about, uh, gosh, I don't know, wherever those numbers are. 30-something or so overall in terms of sign-ups. Uh, Kogot School of Business is a close second, which is a thank you for my, my friends from Kogot who are here to either support or heckle me, one or the other, right? I'm not sure which one it's gonna be. Uh, great to see uh, the diversity. A uh, little scared here seeing 19 people sign up in the office of the Provo, so I'm not sure what that, what that means or not, so I'd love to uh, talk with some of those folks afterwards in terms of uh, their participation here. But great, uh, great representation. And glad that y'all be here. Do we have our Washington College of Law person here? Is he, did, he, did he or she make it? We have our one person from the school. No, didn't, didn't make it in here. Well, that's, uh, uh, that, that, literally they signed up just, uh, just yesterday. I saw that change from a zero to a one. So uh, good to see that. So great, uh, great representation in terms of the diversity of the folks that are here. Uh, to get started, uh, this is sort of the agenda that I plan to do over our next uh, 65 minutes or so together. A little bit of background about myself, why me? And then we're going to dive right into it, uh, talk a little bit about syllabus buildup, uh, knowing your audience, talking a little bit about uh, uh, classroom sessions in this model I call the SIPA model, uh, C-I-P-A. Uh, we'll, if we have time, and depending on where we go, I have these, these little things I call the water cooler pain points that we all seem to face um, as professors in the classroom to discuss. And then again, if we have some time, we'll have some opportunity for some open forum to go along with the, uh, with the session here. All right, so first and foremost, why me? You know, why me versus anybody else up here? And, and trust me, any one of you could be up here because we all have experiences in the classroom and things that we've done um, over our time in, uh, you know, in, in American University. Well, I would say just a couple things that maybe gives me a little bit of a different edge in terms of my background and my experience. I've actually been in the training uh, development business for over 25 years, actually closer to 30 in terms of the first company I started working with in 1986 called the International Law Institute. They're still in business, ili.org, if you want to check them out. But I actually launched my own company with a couple of partners uh, in 1994 called the Institute for Public-Private Partnerships. And our objective was to provide education and training to senior government officials around the world on public-private partnership modeling, uh, regulatory reform, and infrastructure development. And we built a really cool company, a great practice in this area. And from that, we were able to leverage that into a consultancy world. But from the training standpoint, our purpose is here I've literally spent from age 23 till when I left uh, and I sold my company in, uh, in 2008, left this, the business in 2013, I have put on hundreds of, of courses, I have put together curriculums, I have sat through thousands of hours of presentations, I've worked with hundreds of adjuncts, specialists and expertise to help them put courses together. It was like an apprenticeship, you know, in terms of going through it. And I think that probably does make me a little bit different than other folks in the room in terms of the background. As I, just, it came through osmosis to me in terms of just working through this and being a part of a training education company for a long time. I also did a lot of teaching back then too, um, and there were intensive assignments. I'd be in Nepal for five days teaching for seven hours a day for five to six days in a row. So it really honed in some different skill sets that I was able to develop along that lines. Uh, so some pretty good stuff, and that's, that's mostly what I'm going to be pulling from for our discussion today. At Kogod, uh, a couple things. I did start out as an adjunct uh, professor. Who, any adjuncts in the room here? All right, great, congratulations. 
Uh, I was at for one year, and that was in sort of the transition uh, period when I was leaving my, my company after I had sold it. Uh, I'm in my sixth year now as a term faculty, so I am um, uh, a contract faculty. Term faculty in here? Okay, yep, so good, all right. Saying hello to the brotherhood there. Um, and at Code God, I do two things. One, I teach a class called Introduction to Business, which is mostly for freshmen and some sophomores. This class is uh, geared for students who've declared business as a major to take in the fall. In the spring, we have a mix of students. It's uh, half Code God students, half from other schools, students who may be interested in, uh, in taking business or majoring or, or minoring in business. The kind of the neat thing about the class is uh, we do teach it as a cohort. Um, we've got 12 sections each year. I'm the faculty coordinator for this. So I'm involved with working with our, our core faculty who are some terms, some adjuncts, uh, a bunch of TAs we have working with us. We have roughly 300, 350 students a year who go through this. So we teach this class as a cohort. So it's, it, that in and of itself has challenges when you think about being a professor and everybody teaching from the same materials, the same syllabus, the same Blackboard site, Everything is the same. It's all uh, uh, in harmony together. And then I teach some upper level classes. One on business planning strategies to juniors and seniors. This class, I teach it solo, which is how probably most of us are. I also sometimes consider it a silo, which probably we often feel too in teaching classes that we're kind of all alone out there on an island teaching uh, a particular class by ourselves. Uh, I've taught graduate students before um, throughout my, my tenure here throughout my time here, uh, but have moved on uh, from that. And I'll probably go back and teach graduates at some other point. And then lastly, I'm the co-director of the American University Center for Innovation. So I get to work with students who are doing startup companies across campus. And this is a cross-campus initiative. So if you have any students who are interested in, in the startup world, please send them my way. We're delighted to work with, uh, with folks from all the different schools across campus. So a little disclaimer here. These are all my, my thoughts, my ideas, um, things that I've been successful and failed in the classroom in terms of what we're going to talk about today. This isn't based on any research, any studies done, anything like that. There's plenty of other sessions uh, through the conference to, that focuses on that. This is really just my experiences and things that I've been able to do in the classroom. So I hope you'll all will get some benefit out of that as we move forward here. All right, so a couple things here. So how many of you use this your first course teaching? Have anybody in here first course? All right, a couple folks. Good, good. Uh, first year teaching? Okay, so first year, a little bit there. How about less than three years? And the other folks more greater than three years in terms of involvement? Okay, good. All right, so nice mix there. What are your typical class sizes? You guys roughly 15 to 20 students in a class. All right, who has a little bit bigger, 25 to 30? Who has the, the monster classes, 50 or more? Okay, 40? Okay, yeah. Most of my classes are about 35. I, I do top the scale at 40 sometimes when the students say, please, 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 please please let me in to take your class. So, um, so from around 25 to 30 um, is my typical class size. All right, so let's jump into this a little bit. So we have two options here for classes. We've got two times a week, which is roughly 28 class sessions at 75 minutes each. Uh, we have block classes, which are roughly 15, well, four, if you include the exam, 15. If you don't, it's 14 at about two and a half hours each. So that's about 37 hours of classroom time. Right, in terms of what we do here. And for our newbies here today, they're probably saying, oh crap right now, right? You know, oh my goodness, what am I gonna do in 37 hours? The most I've done is a 15 minute speech in a, you know, for a presentation somewhere, right? Well, hopefully we can get through some of those, those issues uh, today here. So the way I like to think about it, I think it really starts with the syllabus. And uh, you know, it may sound a little cliche-ish when you think of it that way, but to me that is your core strategy document for your class, hands down. So let's look at a couple things here. First and foremost, um, structure and organization is key. This is what you're handing out to your students. It's got to be right. It's got to look good. It's got to be tight. Everything has to work. Some of you who've had mistakes in your syllabus, like me, several times, you know, there's nothing worse than having to reissue a syllabus, telling students, ignore that one, work from this one, that's wrong, that link didn't work. So you really have to make this thing work really well. So really focus on structure and organization first, then be creative. All right, then be creative. This is, as I said, your go-to document, I think, for the students. Everything the student needs should be in here. I learned my lesson early. I thought I was pretty cool. I would say, okay, I'm going to have the syllabus. I'm going to post things on Blackboard here. I'm going to have due dates over here, due dates here. And boy, when you change one due date, you definitely forget to change the others in four or five other locations. So I stopped doing that after my first year, just in one place. And wherever else I say assignments, I say, go to the syllabus. 
go to the syllabus, go to the syllabus. And that cuts down on a lot of errors. And when you change your course for next year, you're not thinking, oh god, I gotta go change the date here, the date here, the date here when it comes to that. I assume that, do your schools provide you guys with a template to use? Yes. Okay, all right, just in terms of the, a potential structure. Anybody not get a template from your schools? A couple folks. All right. I'll happy to share our CoGod one with you guys uh, in, a, in a Dropbox share box afterwards. Um, but if you don't, um, you know, usually they put in all the, the stuff that you need in there, and then you know you can build your syllabus around that. So again, my, my one theme here is one place only. Let's keep it all in one place only. It'll save you a lot of time and problems, and it'll certainly save your students a lot of times and problems. So how do we build it? All right. I think the syllabus represents all of your, what I call your heavy duty thinking on your part. And this is the cool stuff. This is when you're really conceptualizing what everything's gonna look like for your course. And you should be embracing this. This isn't, you know, this is, the, this is what you're being hired for, right? To pick this apart, your brain apart, in terms of putting this into something that somebody is gonna find useful in terms of a course and in terms of class sessions. So embrace it. This is really the, should be the best part, the fun part. Of, uh, of, your, of your role in, in getting your intellectual property out there to, uh, to potential students. So how do you build it? Well, I like to start with modules first. Right? When I'm thinking about either a brand new course if I'm having to, to, to start a new course, or even when I'm looking at revising my existing courses, and I think about each course having three or four modules all right, to it, and three or four themes, if that's a better mm -hmm. word you'd like to have to go with that. So for a two times a week course, maybe about seven or eight classes fall under each module. For one of your block classes, maybe three or four classes fall under each one of those, uh, those modules that go into it, okay? Second, then you create your individual class session titles underneath each one of these modules. So this helps keep you grounded. By working under a module or a theme, now you're thinking about what class ses sessions will resonate with that particular theme that, or, or module that we're actually coming up with, okay? So that's a, sort of your second step to, to what I think is effective building a class. Then third, you'll actually build out your individual class sessions and what you want to go into it. And that's, gonna, that's the SIPA model, which I'll talk about a little bit later on here. Uh, probably the big reversal here that I do differently than maybe a lot of you do, I do learning outcomes last. Okay? I don't start with learning outcomes when I'm putting together a new course or when I'm revising a course. I think that should naturally flow from what I'm building here already. And then I can see, okay, here's my ta-da. Here's what, here's what I'm expecting students to come out of this. Some of you may think differently, that doesn't make sense, I really want to do my learning outcomes first and then build a course, but I find if I start with some, some high level themes that I want to get across, what are my class session titles going to look like, what are my sessions going to look like, then the outcomes will just pop, I mean they're right there, you've already put it together, now they, they come up from the page really easily and really, uh, really simple to, to see. So let me show you an example, Here's, this is my Management 383 class, this is my Entrepreneurship class that I teach. So I say this course is divided into three modules with class sessions attributed to each module. So module one is industry trends, problem ID, solution, market analysis, and competition, classes one through four. Module two, go to market, operations, risk factors, financial forecasting, classes five through nine. And module three, launching and financing a startup, classes 10 through 15. Now as you can see here, I have some different titles. These are pretty intensive, lots of words in them. And this is a little bit vaguer, right? Launching and financing startup in the next for six classes, we're going to be talking about that. Whatever works for you is fine. You know, again, depending on what the content is and the subject matter may dictate what makes most sense for you. So in this case, I thought a little heavier wording made more sense. Down here, I kept it a little broader in terms of what those modules are. And so under each of these, I will build my class around that. And then as I'm going along, I may change these module titles and massage them and get them in a little bit better shape as I'm going through that process of creating the, um, the syllabus. This is an example of sort of my core syllabus structure, you know, forgetting all the other pieces that go into it and everything, but this is, this is the, the, the go-to part that I like to call as part of the syllabus structure. So I have the top line, class dates, topics, assignments and activities, the graded assignment due, here's the module title, here's class one, January 14th, Monday, and here are all the things that need to be done or activities that need to be carried out as part of that particular module. So we've got uh, readings to do, video, uh, article link outs, uh, another video to watch, article, and this is what they need to complete by that, by that time frame. Student pro profile survey by 4 o'clock online, here's the student profile for them to complete. Now that's kind of a, you know, a typical class. Here's another one a little bit later on. Um, product development, this is class number three. 
February 4th, Monday. Um, again, here are the readings, the reading titles to go with it. Um, I've actually had a case study that they need to do. It's a, it's a podcast on Rent the Runway with uh, Jen uh, Hyman, who's one of the co-CEOs. They uh, listen to the podcast, and then their assignments are here. They've got a couple things that aren't showing up earlier, but uh, you know, this is what they need to turn in. Their industry analysis, print, turn into class, rent the runway, they have assignments that tied to this. But this way, to me, it helps me keep organized on what they're doing, and the students too. It's the one place they go to to find everything they need, and, and the links that they need, everything in one place. Because if I start to put this stuff in other spots, again, you're going to get confused, they're going to get confused, and eventually you're going to get tripped up and you're going to not have the right date in there, and the students, you know, got you on that one, right, you know, in terms of that. So I find this structure to be really um, easy. It, it makes for a, a, a pretty robust looking syllabus, but again, if it's all in one place, then er that's where everybody needs to go in terms of finding that. Um, one other example um, on your learning outcomes, uh, you know, one thing that I find very helpful is to please make them as action-oriented words as you can. I like to use ing at the end to, to, make, it, to make it sort of action-oriented, active uh, in terms of what they're doing. So for example, we're going to be identifying and examining data to find gaps in business models. We're going to be evaluating new ventures. We're going to be creating a business plan. We're going to be designing and presenting 30-second pitches, two-minute cocktail party pitches, a six to 10-minute investor grade pitch. So it just makes it a little bit more action-oriented. I think on general you need maybe six to ten of these. Um, you know, you don't want to go overboard with it, uh, but it, but it should really tie back in. And what I find, again, by by building out everything first and then going back and, and doing the learning outcomes, it's really easy to then do this. You know, and 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 make your course be the, the driver behind what your learning outcomes are going to be. All right. So that's all I'm going to really say about the syllabus. So the key thing here um, for those of you who have. 48 hours to finish your syllabus before Monday. Uh, you know, I, I'm not going to go into all the, the, the deeper details behind it, but the key takeaways that I want you to have is this is the one go-to place to go for it and make it so that, it, to me, everything is in one place. All right, So you've got it there. You've got all the details located in one place. It'll save you a lot of time, and it'll save uh, your students a lot of time. All right, the second thing I want to talk about here is, is knowing your audience a little bit in terms of the classwork. And I'm not going to go through the usual, sort of, here are the characteristics of Generation Z, who are now our freshmen, sophomores, or Generation uh, uh, Y, or Millennials, whatever you want to call them, who are the, the students who are junior, seniors, and our grad students. You know, there's plenty of stuff online for that, everything that you need to find on that. Um, here's what, I'm, what I think you need to know about the students, and let me, I'll go through each group here. Freshmen and sophomores, who, who teaches freshmen and sophomores in the class? All right, a lot of folks here, good. All right. They are still impressionable. Okay? They are still impressionable. They will mostly take you at your word at this stage, though. Okay? Because they are impressionable. They'll mostly, they'll mostly, I, originally I had they will take you at your word, but then I figured they're not always take you at your word. But they'll mostly take you at your word right now. And so from the beginning, you've got credibility. All right? They, you, they're kind of fresh to you. You're, they're fresh to the university. You've got the credibility and respect at this stage already. So now make the most of that. How do you make the most of that as someone who's teaching freshmen and sophomores? I think the key thing here is you know, figuring out what that impact might be on your training. So first thing is, you have a real opportunity to influence early, right? Because whatever they're getting out of your class, they're going to be able to take that for other classes, use that in other classes, use that in real life, because you're the first ones on the front lines to, to teach them. Whatever your subject matter is, that, that sort of set that aside, you're the first ones that have that. So make the most of that in terms of that. I like to think that this is a great time to get students doing best practices of things. You know, in the business school with, with our KSB 100 class, we work with, we have a communications uh, department in the business school. We work very closely with them on how to do writing and research and presentations. We talk with the various departments, the accounting department, the finance department, the marketing department, to talk about what do we, what do we need to do in our class that will help you? What are tools that you have that you're using in your upper level classes, maybe we can do light versions now in the early classes that they can keep getting used to using some of the same things over and over again. And that builds a lot of trust and it also builds a lot of continuity between what you're doing early and what your upper class classes may have when they get into much more details with it. Um, you know, just a small example of this. We, we had the business librarian come into our freshman class in the third class session 
Uh, her name is Amanda Click, does a wonderful job with our, our freshman students to talk about business research. She comes in and we have an assignment they do at the very beginning with that. And I love this, this was on one of my evaluations and it, it was just, I pulled this out. I was so glad to have the business librarian come to our class. I have gone and met with her on all my research assignments going forward. So that's really cool. You kind of taught them, you brought in a tool, you brought in some best practices that they can now use going forward with it. So the key thing here, I think, with the freshman sophomores is you got a chance to, to get them on the right path, whatever that means for your content area or the area that you're in. So think about that. What makes a sense? What might make sense in working with other units in your, um, you know, in your, in your school that you can help build on and, and grow those ideas into other, other um, uh, keep, keep building on them. All right. Our second group, juniors and seniors. Who teaches juniors and seniors in the class? Okay. All right. Again, these are all my opinions. These aren't based on any studies or anything. These are just my opinions. They are mostly more cynical and critical in class. All right? They are mostly more cynical and a little bit more critical in class. They want you to prove to me that you know what you're talking about, and then they will buy in. All right? A little bit more proving stuff to me. Prove to me that you're the right person teaching this. Prove to me that you are... Knowledgeable, because now they've been around the bin a little bit, right? They, you know, they've they've been here a couple of years. They've talked to other students about the classes and the faculty. You know, they're a little bit more uh, have a little bit more information on it. So they're going to be a little bit of a different level. You've got to earn credibility and respect at this level. I think a lot more than your freshman and sophomore classes, because you're getting it right from the beginning. Here, this proving you've got to earn a lot more of that credibility going through the the class and the course structure here. So how might this impact your approach to teaching juniors and seniors? Um, I would say your personal experiences, particularly for our term faculty and adjunct faculty, are very, very important in this, in this classroom setting. It's validation of you and your experiences in the classroom. So for example, both of my class sessions I, I teach, I will, about, usually it's about the second class or so, I'll give them about three or four minutes to talk with each other in small groups to put together questions they want to ask me about my career and what I've done in my business. So then we have about a 20 minute sort of Q&A session on me and that's a great way for them to learn more about who you are in a way that, that's pretty you know, easy and it's a great way to start to build that rapport up. And then when you go further through the class and you start talking about different issues where you could bring in your own experiences, that's really, really, really important. So think about that in terms of when you're teaching to be able to bring in your own uh, work experiences or research experiences, anything that might come along that way to serve as vignettes. Great example. Um, I teach this dreadful class session on contracts and insurance. Okay? I, I already see the eyes rolling over. If I started talking about contracts and insurance, right? You know, from a business perspective. Absolutely very important. When I say, well, let me tell you about the two times I've been sued, guess what? Those eyes go really wide. Tell me about those times you were sued. And then we could talk about the contracts, the problems we had, the insurance we had to pay for my $250,000 legal bills and I only had to pay five of that. Sweet, you know, great. Insurance. By the way, we were, everything was fine, we were good. <laughs> but, uh, but so, you know, so think about those things, the ways that you can make that topic better. So I think in this case, as they're getting a little bit older, as we all do, they're, they're questioning more and, uh, you know, and as I said, being a little more critical and being a little more cynical in terms of, 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 their, uh, of their mindset. So graduate students, who teach graduate students in here? All right, great, all right. Grad students are about immediate relevancy. All right, immediate relevancy. If, if it's not relevant, I'm checking out. I'm, I, you don't waste my time. If this doesn't hit me, the second I walk in the room, I'm, I'm, go you know, I'm gone mentally from it, okay? Really, really important to, to think about that. So what I find fascinating about this is with graduate students, you're given respect up until the point you walk into the classroom. And the reason why I say it that way is that most of the grad students have worked for one or two years, you know, in the business school, sometimes three, four, five, or six years. They've been out there. You know, they've worked with people. So they're assuming when they come to grad school that you know your stuff, right? That you're, you're on it. So they're already, they're giving you that respect, right, from the beginning. Why would you be teaching a graduate school program unless you've got that, right? So, but, what, but it only lasts till the minute you, they walk into the classroom. After that, you've got to earn it again, just like with the undergraduates. Even more so, I think it's more intense with the graduate students. Every second is really, really important. And I think you've got to, you know, you know, I always want you to bring your A game to every class session that you teach, but I think with the graduate students, you've got to do your A double plus game. 
And let me give an example, you know, from, from my experience. You know, when I've taught grad classes before, um, you know, I do a couple sections on financial model. How do you build a, how do you build a revenue model and a cost model for a startup company? Well, I've got students in there who have had five years of financial experiences with Goldman Sachs. What the hell can I teach them about finance, right? They, they can run circles around it when it comes to finance, right? Easily run circles around it. So how do I make it relevant to them so I've given them something new that can benefit them? So as a teacher, you've got to think about that, right? You've got to look at that and say, I, particularly grad students, they're going to have experiences out there. And I've got to make sure that I'm on point with them on everything that we do. And that's a new challenge. I just can't, I can't teach it the same way that I would to an undergrad who hasn't had financial, you know, who doesn't know how to do financial models. These folks, they, they can write the book on it. They should be teaching it, not me, right, when, when you look at it from that perspective. So you really, really, I think, have to be, you know, much more, and you've got to really think a little bit differently about it when it comes to your audience. So a couple of tips, I think, in dealing with helping you think this through a little bit. First and foremost, please review your rosters. You know, now. You know, go up to Eagle Services uh, from the AU portal, download them, understand the mix, understand the schools that you're in. You know, some of you may be all the same. You know, others, you may have students who are taking your classes electives. You know, I'm not sure, what, you know, obviously what your different class structures are. But really understand that and know who they are, where they're from, um, so you can start to get a sense of, of, of a little bit about them. Also, I think something that's really important to know early on is are they taking the class for a grade or are they taking it pass-fail? And you want to know the students who are taking pass-fail so you don't get too worried about them. Because I've gotten really frustrated with students before in the past, like, why are they not doing this? Why are they not working on this? And they go, Professor White, I'm taking the class pass-fail. And I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah. So think about that. You know, it, it does help you to not be maybe too concerned about a particular student. But most importantly, if you have team projects, you want the other team members to know that this person is taking that class pass-fail. Because I've had disaster team experiences when someone who was taking a pass-fail, hey, I'm getting the same grade as everybody else. I don't need to do anything, right? So if you want to, you know, that's something you just want to keep in mind, you know, in terms of that, uh, you know, in terms of understanding that. I'm also a big believer in getting um, Certain online surveys about my students and their backgrounds and interests and things like that. I know they get so tired of filling these things out and they probably wish there could just be one that we could all have access to. Uh, but I think it's a really important part of you know learning more about their interests, their their skills, what they're good at, what they're not good at. I always ask for their LinkedIn profile, um, you know, in terms of getting that so I can you know if I want to learn more about who they are, I can do that. But I think that's a great way to really really understand your students, and I think it it, it means a lot to them. Um, you know, I had a student this year for the first time um, uh, in my freshman class from the country of Albania. And uh, I did a lot of work in Albania for a number of years. And so for me to be able to go up to her in the first class and say, you know, start talking about Tirana and Korcha and Elbasan and all these towns, and it just lit her up. Like, oh my God, no one has even ever heard of Albania before. Yeah? And now here's someone, my professor, who's been there. So even that, just that little nugget, that's just a simple one. You know, that type of stuff, getting to know your students. Now, if you're in a 50-plus class, obviously that's a lot harder. But in your smaller ones, take that extra time to, uh, to make that happen. Um, international students. Um, you know, we are, um, uh, continues to be a, a challenge that I see right now, uh, particularly with, with the addition of the International Accelerator Program, the IAP students coming in. We've seen our, our class dynamics changing in the, in the business school. Um, <laughs> I'm not saying good or bad, either way, it's just changing, and we're trying to adopt to that and sort of figure that out a little bit of what, how we're gonna work through things um, with a greater population of international students. Um, there's language issues, there's communication issues, there's challenges on teams that we're beginning to face. We're trying to work through it. All I can recommend is, uh, in the business school, we have somebody we can work with. In, in the other schools, I, I don't know what the, what, how you guys are working through that or not, but find someone who can, who can help you with this, uh, because it is an issue. And it's something that, that, that I, I see it becoming more and more um, important to deal with so we can make sure everyone's getting the same experiences across the board. Uh, meeting one-on-one -on -one with students. Uh, I think that's the most fun part of teaching, as far as I'm concerned. Of course, nobody ever shows up to office hours, right? Um, except if they're, they're the superstar students because they want to come and talk to you about career and life and all those things, or because there's a problem with their grade in some way, shape, or form. I haven't done this before, but maybe something to think about. Maybe you require students to come at least once or twice. Anybody do that in the group here? Does it work? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so I think that's a, that's a pretty good thing. If you're not getting a lot of folks coming in for office hours, um, you know, except for, you know, 
reasons, <laughs> you know, for for if that, it's a great way to do that, and I would you know, I'd recommend that as a as an option to uh, to to consider for that. All right, and the last thing here is something I call the five ten five rule. Um, you're not going to reach everybody every single time in every single classroom. All right, it's just not going to happen. And I use this thing I call the five ten five rule. So I have twenty people on average. Five people in a room are really going to be into that subject matter for that day. They're going to be all over it. It's what they love. It's great. It's wonderful. On the other side, five people are, are, are going to be completely tuned out. They're not interested. It doesn't make sense. They're not into it for whatever reason. And then you have this middle ground ten, which you're sort of getting some with, sometimes not. You know, it's kind of they kind of working for the most part, uh, but not always. And so my my comment on this is. You can't really worry about that bottom five at that moment in time. Because the next class is going to change again. Yeah? So for example, if you're a history professor, you're teaching, you know, war since you know 1910 or whatever. You know, you may have students who really get into World War I, but have no interest in World War II. Yeah? Or Vietnam War. You know, maybe my grandfather fought in the Vietnam War and I have a lot of interest in that. So it's going to change a little bit. And I used to get really, really worried or upset about you know, that five in that particular class session. But then I realized, the very next day, it's going to change. You know, and that, that dynamic is going to change. There's always going to be a group that are always into everything. But sometimes you just have to say, OK, at this moment in time, that just didn't resonate with somebody. And, you know, and that's OK. Obviously, you don't, you, know, you don't want it to be a consistent leaving people behind. And, and, you know, and you'll, you'll know that from your, your, your evaluation scores and other feedback that you get. But sometimes it's just, you, know, you just have to say, this class session is maybe not resonating with someone um, as much as I'd like to, and you know, and you just have to uh, accept that from that perspective. All right. Lastly, with our audience, two two sort of final challenges here that I see. One is engagement is absolutely critical, um, and we you know we know that and we see that from you know just the distractions that students have out there with the technologies and everything that's going on that you know they are and do want lots of engagement. Okay, lots of engagement in uh, you know in the classroom. The second one, and um, uh, that I that I think is, is also equally important, if not more, is I feel we're working with with generation of students that don't know how, or who are worse don't want to go deep into subject matters as much. And I'm finding it difficult sometimes in my classroom to get students to go that next level of whatever that is of writing or research or development or the time put into something. And I know there's all kinds of stuff going on. I understand that. I mean, my class is one of five and everything else going on in their lives. But I feel that this is a challenge that we need to address as, as professors to make sure we're teaching students the skills to go deep into the content, deep into what they're learning. Uh, some of the best students I have in, in, when, I, when I teach my class are those who do come from the sciences, uh, particularly uh, biology. And uh, I have some groups, from, uh, we have a biotech program and some of the life science, because they, they've learned some techniques of how to do deeper research. Uh, but I think this is, a, this is an issue that I see a lot in classrooms. And, and students giving up too early. Well, I Googled that, and I couldn't find it on the front page. You know, what do I do now, professor? You know, and I'm like, go. You know, you've got to do more than that. You just can't quit after five minutes on it. So I think this is something that, um, that I, I see as, a, as an issue that I hope we all can start to think about and address. So what I do want to talk about now is so how might we address this in the classroom part of what we do here. So what I want to talk about is the is the, the CIPA model, CIPA model, however you want to pronounce it. CIPA. Um, C stands for content, I stands for illustration, P stands for practice, and A stands for application. Okay? Uh, what I'm about to present to you, there's no secret sauce here, and, and if I just if I just left right here and stopped here and let you guys talk about it, I think you'd probably come up with all the answers to what all of these are. All right, there's nothing super complicated about it, but what I hope I can put together for you is a little bit of a framework that can help you think about how I could use this in my classroom structures and setting up my classroom structures. So let's start with content, all right? Because that's the baseline of any course, doesn't matter what we teach, or what we're in, that is certainly the baseline of our, our program here. Textbooks, certainly one method for conveying content through our students. Um, journals, professional journals is certainly another way. Articles and things like that that we have uh, that we can provide. Um, that's sellers and books that are out there that, uh, that may make sense for us. This, uh, anybody ever read this book? What they don't teach you at Harvard Business School? A couple of books? Eh, no. All right. Classic. You've got to read it if you, if you have. 
It was a 1980s, a guy named uh, McCormick wrote it. He started this sports management company called IMG. And uh, it's all about relationships and, and communications in the, you know, in the workforce. And the beauty of it is it's all pre-internet, right? It's all pre-computer, so it's all about how you communicate. I used this in my graduate class, and they said it was the best textbook they ever had in their two years in, in college. So think outside of the box. There's some pretty cool stuff out there that can resonate that you might not think might resonate, because this is all before the internet. It has nothing to do with, with anything on that. And uh, it's all about how you communicate, how do you negotiate, how do you talk to people, how do you get business, and all the things. So it's pretty cool. Um, obviously, the internet is another resource that we have and pool available. Podcasts. I've, just this first year, I've really started to use a couple podcasts. I'm really happy with it, really impressed with it. The students seem to like it a lot. And of course, videos. Um, you know, all kinds of stuff that's out there uh, that, that can be used in, in classroom environments. So my key takeaway from here is, please think about using a variety of resources to, to reach your audience, okay? Um, they want it. They want the diversity in the way that you, you present your content to them. They don't want just they don't want to just read 60 pages in the textbook each week. Give them some other choices to build around what that content's going to look like. They're going to like a lot more. You're going to have fun finding stuff and piecing things together along with it. Okay? When you're out there doing the research and pulling things out, your job is to curate this, right? You're, you're putting the best that's out there by you're doing all the, the legwork to go through you know 20 business videos or, or, or listening to 15 case studies that NPR does on, you know, on startup companies to go through that process to find the right one that will fit what, I'm gonna, what I want to have as part of my classroom session. Okay? So the key takeaway here is variety of resources. That's what I would uh, say is the most important. Illustrations, again, nothing super secret about this. Case studies, using case studies as much as possible, case vignettes, um, guest speakers. Who uses guest speakers in your classes? Okay, please keep doing that. Um, the students love it. It's a great way to illustrate content. If you're not using it, I would really encourage you guys to, uh, to build that out. Okay, it's part of that prove it to me a little bit. You know, you're sitting there talking to them, you're having to read stuff, and then you bring in someone outside to validate what you're talking about. You know, that just works magic with your juniors and seniors and, of course, with your, with your grad students. Your own experiences, I mentioned earlier, bring those into the classroom. Okay, students want to hear about it. But you need to set it up early, like I said before. Let them know who you are. Take 15, 20 minutes in one of your early class sessions to really give them a great understanding of who you are. And then, as you pepper through the class and go through the class sessions, you can use your experiences to bring those in to illustrate certain things. And the last one um, is getting them outside of the classroom. In our, in our freshman class, our Business 1.0 class, one of the requirements is they have to go to two COVID events that are not in our classroom. So COCOD puts on all kinds of you know, panels and conferences, just like all of our schools do. And we make them go. We make them go. They can choose. They have to go to two. Each semester they go. They have to do a little bit of write-up. They have to tell us who they met. And it's a great way to get them outside of this bubble of the classroom and, and, and the classroom work to get them to go. It's like pulling teeth, but when they go, they have a wonderful time. They learn new things. They meet new folks. And from our perspective, we want them to go onto campus and, and take advantage of these things. In my upper level classes, I make them go off campus. I make them use, use the resources of Washington, D.C., which, as we all know, are just amazing. So they have to go and attend events. I give them some links to go to to find stuff. eBright has all kinds of things. Meetup, you know, meetup.com, entrepreneurs, meetup.com, marketing, meetup.com, World War II history. There's all kinds of groups that are out there that have that have panels, they have breakfasts, they have all kinds of stuff. It's, and it's a great way to get your students out of the classroom and talking and meeting with people in, uh, you know, in the business, in, in the world you know, of, of your, uh, uh, that, they're, that they're involved with. So the key here from an illustration point is who is doing it now? And I mean it, that's your, your content, your subject matter. Who is doing it now and getting those folks uh, to involve with it? All right, the third one is practice. Um, and again, no super uh, secrets here at all. Practice, obviously, for our life sciences, anything in the laboratory would certainly fit along that lines. Research in the library. Um, and then probably the most important, I think, is problem solving, small group exercises, things like that, where students can work together uh, to really you know, identify things and practice what we have taught in the particular content that we've developed here. So um, one way to think about it is you know, research that they're doing, Problem solving, analysis. In the business school, we have recommendations. That's sort of a, a part of our thematic issues, but maybe in other schools it's about you know, 
looking at this first part and coming up with some type of analysis of what uh, what transpired and what and what happened with it. All right, then the last one, application. How do we apply all this to it? All right, so certainly we in our classes we have research reports, writing assignments that we do uh, that we we get folks to you know to put uh, uh, pen to paper on. Um, I would say if there's a possibility to expand that, particularly for our research faculty, to get them involved with publishing real stuff out there, joint publications, things like that. I, I don't know much about that field, but I, I, with the folks I've talked with, I think the students love it. It's a great way to get them applying what they're doing into a real environment, and they get really excited about it to know that that might be a possibility for them. Competitions, really neat area, if you haven't thought about this. Two, from two perspectives. One are competitions that are held here and actually integrating that into your class. You know, maybe there's a there's a history expose competition that people are you know debating some topic that's you know that the uh, you know, International Society for whatever is holding. You know, maybe you have your students participate in that, you know, and, and be a part of that. It's a great way to build that up. Uh, uh, in our iTech 200 class in the business school, they actually have a, a pitch presentation competition. They've got five or six sections that through the semester they're developing this idea. They present it to a panel of judges. There's winners from each section that go to the finals, and there's someone who's awarded you know, the winner of the entire competition. And so it's a great way to build that in and again, give some of that application to real world experiences. And then of course, anytime you can get students to, to do presentations, 30 second pitches, two minutes, five minute formal presentations, we've got to get them out, we've got to get them talking. Okay, this is a big gap that we continue to see over and over again. Students, it's very painful for them to do this. I see most of the time they don't like it for the most part, um, but we've got to keep them doing it. That's what real world stuff is. So the more we can get them practicing that in class is, uh, I think is, is really, really, really important. So anything we can apply to make it real life, I think is, is, is just super important for our classroom structures. All right, so let's tie it all together. All right. So we start with the content, all right? And the content provides the foundation for everything we're talking about in, you know, in the classroom, all those pieces that we want to put together. We use that as a foundation to, to then have ways to illustrate what that content's about, bringing in stuff to illustrate what we're doing in terms of our content. Then we want to give them a chance to practice it. Okay, we've gone through these different things here. Now let, let's try it out. Let's give you a chance to, to try it, practice a little bit, do some problem solving, do some exercises to give you a chance to feel a little bit better about it. And then the big one here is the application part, which should really transcend everything that you do in the classroom and building it out all the way across the board to really, how do we apply this to real world situations that are out there and make that happen in terms of that. So when we think about it, um, you know, engagement, going deep, reinforcement, that's kind of what I see the SIPA model doing here, you know, in terms of those issues that we raised earlier about getting students engaged with the content, with the subject matter, the materials, all of this kind of makes that happen. You know, going deep. You know, if we could go deep in the application part, which is really the part where you want to go deep, then they're really getting a really good experience that they can take and hopefully use and replicate elsewhere with it. And of course, this whole process just keeps reinforcing the things that we want to do in our particular class sessions. All right, so now uh, a quick reality check, all right? The American University mission statement, okay? You know, let's tie it back to what we're about when we think about what our part of our role here as teachers. So I've truncated a little bit. I, I left out a couple of the bullet points, but I wanted to focus on the ones that were about teaching and, um, and uh, uh, in the classroom. So here's uh, the, the university distinguishes itself through a broad array of undergraduate graduate programs that send from these primary commitments. Interactive teaching through providing personalized education experiences, research and creative ende endeavors consistent with its distinctive missions, generating new knowledge. Practical application of knowledge is through experiential learning, taking full advantage of the resources of the Washington, D.C. area. So when I look at this model and structure, I feel like it's, it's, it's hitting all those. It's about being interactive. It's about being engaged. It's about being practical in terms of this. So I, I feel like it's time coming back full circle to what our mission is you know, in terms of the, the university to make this structure um, you know, work together as, as one. All right, so now how do we turn that into a, a classroom session? You know, an actual classroom. So we have two options here. One, of course, is our two-day a week, uh, twice a week class is 75 minutes, and then our block class that we have once a week. So what I think is reasonable is for a, for a twice a week class, for each class session, preparation of your content, one to three hours, I don't think is unreasonable in terms of that. 
Um, over your 75 minutes, your five minutes of announcements, 30 minutes of content reinforcement, I'll come back to that in a second, 30 minutes roughly of illustration of practice, and then 10 minutes of, oops, 10 minutes of sort of pulling everything together. To me, this, this is a very important session here, okay? And what I've found with a, with a lot of professors that I've talked to is that they default too much to the easy route, which may be, well, I'm just going to use the slides that the textbook provided me. Right? And I don't think that's really fair, you know, for the students or for you. Because, you know, we're here for our intellectual knowledge to bring to bear here. And so what I would challenge everyone here, if you're using some sources there, I would challenge you to, to take whatever your content is in those different vehicles that you're developing and do it in your own words, all right? Build your own content sessions to reinforce the readings and the videos and the podcasts that they're watching here. Make it yours. Make it your own. A, you'll, you'll have a lot of enjoyment doing it. It's not easy. I mean, it's, it's a little bit of a challenge. But you'll find that you have a lot more ownership over that particular content. And please make sure there's a lot of discussions as part of that. It cannot just be straight lecture, which is what I'm doing to you guys right now. Uh, but you know, have it so it's discussion and dialogue oriented as much as you can with that. And then for your illustration practice session, you know, whatever makes sense. You know, again, Maybe it's a long case study. Maybe it's a couple of short vignettes. Maybe it's a problem, series of problem solvings that students can work together on. Your job then is to tie things together and bring it together to show how that illustration works for your particular content. In a block class, you know, it's sort of the same structure, just different time frames. I think you know, your preparation of the con for content for each, um, each class session should be roughly two to four hours you know, in terms of that. Your announcements period, 60 minutes, roughly for content reinforcement. Uh, always give a break. Yeah, they all, everybody wants a 10 minute break in there. Um, 60 minutes for illustration, practical exercises, and then 10 minutes to pull it together. All right, so here you have a little bit of a different challenge because the, the timing is bigger, right? You know, and, and it's, you know, it's a little bit harder to do that. But again, it's, all, it's 14 classes instead of 28 classes. And I would again go with the same framework here, which is, the content should be yours, reinforcing what you want to bring to bear on what, what you've had them, had them read, listen to, watch, whatever those, uh, whatever those content pieces are. And here, you know, the illustrations are, you know, I found that I use um, more detailed cases here if I'm doing that. You know, I'll go into a little bit more detail. Guest speakers, I'll, I'll, I'll give them a little bit more time, maybe 25 minutes for everything that they're doing. You know, in the shorter class, maybe it's a little bit shorter with it. Um, but again, how you want to, to frame it is fine, you know, there can be intermixed here. Like sometimes I'll bring in case vignettes as I'm doing my discussions here, content reinforcement, and that works for a particular class session. So, uh, you know, whatever makes sense for you um, uh, certainly is the, is the way to go with that. All right, so how does this tie, this model tie into, into assignments, okay? Well, it's pretty, pretty straightforward. You know, if you give any type of quizzes, you're gonna be addressing content, illustration practice. If you give exercises, obviously that's the practice part. Exams is, is, is going to be illustrating illustration uh, content, illustration practice. Any research that you're having them do, validation, is obviously practice and application. Any writing requirements that you have, practice, uh, application, videos that you may ask them to do, same thing. And of course, presentation is also about practice and applications. So any assignments sort of can tie back in really nicely to these, uh, these particular issues as we go along with that. So again, I just view this as a framework and a way to, to think about how you can structure your class sessions and what, what are the pieces that you want to do. But for me, the challenge is, and what I'm challenging you guys to do is, how do I do this so it, it's, it's cohesive, it works, and then all of those pieces come together so the students have a really good experience and you're excited about teaching that particular content session that you have with that. All right. So I want to be able to save a couple of minutes at the end for questions. I'd like to move to what I call the water cooler pain points, if we can do that. Okay? Is that all right, everybody? All right. So here's my first water cooler pain point. Great. All right? Um, I learned very quickly that what gets great gets done. And you probably have too. I remember my first couple of class sessions when I had these really cool articles. And I said, what you guys think about them? Weren't they great? And you just have this blank stare of students at you. And you say, well, how many of you guys read it? And maybe one person's hand went up, right? So, um, if you want something done, you've got to put some points to it, right? That's the only way it's going to happen. So make sure you, uh, you do it. We, we think that they, that they want it for their intellectual stimulation, but yeah, they've got a lot going on, and uh, so you've got to put a little bit of points to go with it. All right, the second one I think is really, really important. 
Schedule grading blocks of time on your calendar at the beginning of the semester. Okay? Look at what your assignments that you have to do. If you have papers that you've got to grade or exams or whatever, block out whatever time you need. Three hours, six hours, 12 hours, 15 hours, whatever it is, put it on your schedule now. Because what's going to happen is you're going to start populating those times with meetings and phone calls and stuff, and you really have to be concentrated and dedicated to, to slog through some of the stuff that you have to do. So I really, really, and this way, you can see it on there and say, oh, I can't meet that, I'm going to be grading. All right, and it's a great way to, to help you manage your schedule a lot better. And for our newbies in the classroom, whatever you think is going to take one hour to grade, it's going to take you three times as much to grade it, okay? So just plan for that. All right, um, this is something else that I sort of have my own little mental social contract with my students is I return all graded work within a week, and I post all grades up in Blackboard within that same time frame, okay? This age group likes feedback, they want it quickly, they want it fast, and there's no, I don't think there's any reason why we can't do that if you schedule it out correctly, okay, and you put that on there. So this is kind of my own internal social contract to say, I'm going to get stuff back to you within, within one week at the most, and usually it's faster than that um, in terms of what I do. All right, late assignments. I've tried everything, I've failed miserably on this um, several times. This is what I finally settled on. Um, lose 10% of your grade within the first six hours of it being late, 30% after that. Because what I find when I do submit assignments on Blackboard, I'll get, when it's due at 4 o'clock, I'll get 401, 402, 406, 409, you know, 359, 99, or whatever, 59, 59. Um, so I've, I've gone everywhere on it. Some people are really good at this and hard and say, that's it. You know, and I applaud you. I wish I had that, that backbone to be that strong. I don't. Uh, but this seems to work for me, and, and it seems to work for the students. Yeah. Can't say it's the best, but it, but it works. Uh, does anybody have a target grade that you have to provide? A bell curve or anything like that in your school or programs? Okay. We actually do it in the business school. And not, not in the business school, but in our different departments we do. And so we have different targets that we have to that we have to sort of aim for. It doesn't have to, it's not set in stone, it's more an aiming to it. But, uh, but particularly for our, our um, you know, new faculty members, sort of figure out what, what to grade to and where should we fall. You know, um, I don't know, I think you just need to talk to your department heads about that in terms of uh, what that information might be with that. All right, my second uh, pain point is laptop devices use in the classroom. Um, I've tried everything, and again, I've failed miserably at all of them, all right, in terms of that. I've, Wussed out more times than I can imagine, you know, in terms of implementing a sound policy on this. Um, so here's my latest approach for laptops for this semester. And this was in conversation with a couple of people. So, students may use their laptops and iPads for note taking um, if you agree to the following. I may call on you at any time in class. I don't call on students, I wait for hands to be raised and then I call on them. So, other people have different methods, that's just my method. I don't call on folks who don't have their hands up. So that's just the way I do. So I may call on you any time. Um, several times during the course, I may ask you to email your notes of that day, immediately after class, um, and you pledge that you not use someone else's notes, okay? Because they could easily all be on Google Sheets at the same time, right, and just zip them off if they wanted to, all right? And so if I can't find, if, I, if you're not answering the questions, you know, robustly in class, or I find that your notes are not very robust, you know, I'm going to say you're not really using your laptop for what you're supposed to, and therefore I'm going to take your laptop privileges away from you. We'll see how that one works. <laughs> uh, but I learned I've tried everything, you know, and from ban, you can't ban it because if the student gets an accommodation, you know, then you have to allow it in the classroom. And then all of a sudden this person now sticks out. Why did they get the laptop? And you can't say why because of confidential reasons. So, um, you know, as much as we'd like to do that, we, we can't from that perspective. So I'll try this out. Anybody wants to try it out with me? See if it works or not. Uh, I call this the trust but, but verify. Anybody know who came up with that phrase? Reagan, yes. Uh, with the missile crisis uh, back in when the Soviet Union. He, he used this thing called trust but verify. So I'm calling this my trust but verify attempt at dealing with, uh, with laptop devices in the classroom. All right, missing class policy. Uh, again, everyone has their different things on this. My is one missed class is for free. Start taking some points off if you if you um, if you uh, miss additional classes. Uh, lots of issues that keep coming up. I'm sick. I'm going to miss class. You know, do you ask for a doctor's notes? Do you want something from student services? Again, I found no right way to deal with this. 
Um, you know, now they don't want, the you know, student center doesn't give notes, you know, and half the time they don't want them to go there because they'll, they're contagious and they'll give it to other people. So I, I'm totally lost on this one uh, in terms of it. Um, so I try to be as systematic as I can about it, but I think what I end up doing is I, I, I just gauge the student, you know? And if it's someone who is, and you know, you don't know if they're sick or not, right? I'm sick, I'm emailing them out. You know, if they're coming back in the next day, can I meet with you in office hours? I want to do the work, what did I miss? You know, that, I, I have to start factoring that in, right? Okay, that's positive. If they just disappear, they're not coming in, they don't really care, they missed it. Well, that's another mindset that I have. I try to be systematic about it, but I think at the end of the day, you know, unless, unless the school gives us some real formal policy on it, um, you know, a hard and fast rule on this, I'm not sure what to do. Um, it's, it's any better than that. All right, um, academic integrity, all right, academic integrity. Uh, this is something that's worked really well in our, our classes, um, uh, particularly our freshmen here. About three weeks into the course, remind the students to take academic integrity very seriously, and then we scare them with by showing a sample student's transcript that, that has honor code violations. And I'll give you a copy of it. <laughs> Let you guys know, obviously it's been redacted with the student information, but if you want to take one and pass it around. Um, and this is something that Dave Haar, who's sitting in the back there, he's, he's the head of COGOT's, um, what do you, Academic Violations Committee. Academic Integrity Coordinator. Academic Integrity Coordinator. Coordinator. And, you know, we just take a couple minutes to explain in class, and, and you'll see a couple lines that point out the F that the student got uh, on, their, on their transcript, and then for the reason why they got an F on their transcript. And what we just want to point out to students is, hey, that's on there forever, folks. You know, if you go and apply for grad school, or if you have a job offer that wants, you know, that wants, uh, uh, wants your transcript, you're going to have to explain that every single time, all right, to somebody. So we found this to be pretty effective, I think, right, Devin? You, you've said that it's, it seemed to be, you've, you've gotten less violations, whether this is the reason or not, but, you know, some, something that I think can really help, particularly about a few weeks into school when things start to get really serious and, and busy. I think you're welcome to use this if you want to, you know, in, uh, in your classrooms. I think it's a great way to remind students. Because they don't think that way. They're not thinking three years from now. And I couldn't imagine having to explain why I got an F for an academic violation on my transcript, right? Yeah. Go for it. All right. All right, teams. Teams. Raise your hand if you've never had a problem with a team before. <laughs> huh? No one? No one's never had a problem with a team before? Wow, okay. All right, yes, they, they, are, they are quite the challenge, aren't they? Um, particularly when we start thinking about teams at the beginning, you sort of have two options here. You could do the professor selection team process where you're going for diversity and you know, trying to match whatever's important to you in your classroom as part of that. Or you do the, self, the student self-select where they then come together with people who they know in the classroom or uh, in many cases, speak the same local language, whatever it may be, they come together in terms of that. Um, in, our, in my freshman class, Introduction to Business, we, self, we select the teams for them. In my upper level class, I allow them to self-select their teams uh, with that. I, there's no right or wrong answer on that, uh, you know, in terms of doing that. But we come up with a couple ways to, we think, help manage this process a little bit, all right? And the first one, um, is out of our Management 353 class, right? This is our organizational theory behavior class. Um, they developed this thing called the, the team charter, okay? In terms of um, uh, a way for teams to galvanize around a process. And I just want to show it to you real quickly. I think it's a really um, cool worksheet document that really helps deal with some preliminary issues with, with particular teams. I'm not going to go through all the the components to it. I'll just point out a couple, and I'm happy to share this with anybody if you want to you know, take it and use it, or pieces of it. It's perfectly fine. It just has some introduction stuff. I won't go into that right now. This is really cool. We started doing this for, this year for the first time, and it was a home run. Their very first meeting as a team is not about the project. It's about getting to know each other. And sitting down for an hour over coffee or whatever, we have a little exercise. They've got to introduce themselves and talk about, you know, facts about them, and they go through a little gaming exercise to learn about each other as individuals first. Home run, worked really, really well, really helped with team dynamics. So something I would, I would really encourage you guys to, to think about doing in the, 
in the program. Then the rest of the worksheet is a lot about listing your goals and purpose for the team, the objectives, metrics of the project. Uh, this is a pretty important uh, slide you have to fill out. You know, your name, your role within the team, your personal skills and capability, the availability for meetings, right? That's the biggest, one of the biggest issues we see. Contact information so they can sort of put all this stuff together. But then my favorite part of this whole thing is decision-making rules for the teams, okay? How do they actually work together as a team? And so we have different pieces here. How do we make decisions? How do we schedule meetings? How do we communicate? What's our general meeting etiquette? I.e., do we all turn off our cell phones, you know, for meetings, things like that. Here's the rules, and here's the consequences for not adhering to those rules, right? So this gives them a chance to put stuff down on paper as a team, all right? Because one of the biggest challenges I see that happens when teams start to break down, it becomes between, you know, Sue and Jane, or Bill and Sue, or whatever, you know, it's, it's personality. It's about individual personalities in the team of someone not doing what they're supposed to, right? And step one, I'm talking level one, what's your rules say about this? How do you go back to this? All right, Bill is on his cell phone in the meeting all the time. Well, we got a rule that says no cell phones. Bill, turn it off, all right? And if they can't get it to turn it off, then, you know, then it's come talk to me, you know, whatever, tick. But, but we give them a starting point for it. And this really helps eliminate some of that first sort of ground rumbling that goes on within a team project. So it's something we found very useful. We took a light version of, of, our, of the class and use it in our business class. I use it in an entrepreneurship class too. It's a really helpful thing. I think that the two key ones uh, are the, the get to know you meeting and then the decision making. And then we have them all signed. All right? And they submit as a, as a signed document. So now, again, it doesn't become about the, the individuals. It's about what we agree to as a team. So this process has worked well, like I said, for, for level one, right? Level one issues, right? Um, level two, because in our team projects, everyone gets the same grade on the team projects. So no matter if you did 100% of the work, 50% of the work, or 10% of the work, you get the same grade as everybody else. How we mitigate that, we do have peer reviews as part of that inside the team that goes into the grading too. So there is a chance for people to, you know, to comment and, and provide feedback on it. And then a new thing that I instituted in my upper level class, I don't think I can do it in my freshman class, you're fired. <laughs> I give students a chance about at a certain point in my class where they can remove a team member from their team. And I don't take credit for this. This was, this was from a professor at Babson um, College up in, uh, in uh, Boston area who used that. I thought, hey, it's a pretty cool idea. There's ground rules behind it. They've got to come talk to me first. They've got to come meet as a team, explain why this isn't working out, why they want to go different ways. Um, and, you know, and I've had it happen three times so far in, in the last two semesters. It was a very painful week for everybody, but the end results were much better for everybody, actually. You know, it was a tough week, you know, for that to, when it happened, but it actually worked out really well in the long run because the people got, the students got to do what made sense. But it's only up to a certain point after that, then you then you uh, then you keep going with what you have. So I thought that was an interesting new uh, new twist. Yes. So did the person who got fired fail the assignment? Or no. They have to no. So here's their, so yeah. Work so there's three they have three options. Okay. They could both continue on their own with the same. Everyone gets the same data up to that point, and they go and do. They continue on their own separately. They can start all over with a completely new idea if they want to, or they could try to join another team, which is <laughs> not necessarily <laughs> that hasn't worked yet. <laughs> Uh, why do you Why do you want to join my team? Well, my other teammates didn't, you know, didn't like it, but uh, but no, mostly, you know. So they have choices, with it. and and as a faculty member, you have a really important role here to make sure everything runs smoothly, that it's done in a you know in a, in a positive way. But it also teaches some good lessons too. And after that first week, you know, that's a tough week for everybody. But once they start going, they're like, I've had everyone's come back to me and said that worked out so much better. I'm glad it ended up the way they did. I can't say they're friends that much anymore, but yeah. All right, um, keeping costs down for students, okay? Um, I think it's a real important thing. I think it's an obligation for all of us to do with, with the expenditures that, that, uh, that the school, that the students have. Regular hardback textbooks, $240. On, oops, online curated textbooks, 75 to 125. Open source textbooks are generally 50 to 75. And of course, any other options, videos, article, podcasts are generally free. Um, I have moved away in my, in my Business 1.0 class. We were using a textbook that was about $350. Uh, the first two years we're here, we, we now use flat world knowledge. 
It's an open source introduction to business. It's $49.99 online. Uh, the students can pay $20 more to get a hard copy in color if they want to. And the book is awesome, it's much better, and it's great. And I can almost hear the McGraw-Hill rep crying when he learned he lost 360 sales a year at $350. So, and I said, open source, and he said, yep. <laughs> Um, so, I don't know if that's an option for you guys in terms of what you do here, but please keep that in mind. Explore lives. In my entrepreneurship class, I have no textbooks at all. Everything I pull from online. I curate everything online that I want to use for that, um, for, for that class. All right, my favorite. You don't know an answer to a student's question. They ask a question. If you don't know an answer, this will happen, right? Lots. So, here's my solution. My response is, great question. Does anybody want to respond to this in the classroom? <laughs> Throw it back out to the students, right? Have fun with it, yep. Yeah, it will be questions sometimes, but you, don't, you may not know the answer to it. Um, it's a great way to you know, get students involved and not make you look like an idiot. <laughs> All right, uh, last point here. Technology will fail, okay? It will always fail on you. Have backups, pens, connectors, hard, drop, hard copies of stuff. Anybody use Mac? Do you own your own dongle? Okay, please, if you don't, own your own dongle, all right? That's the most important thing for you when you're trying to connect with other, other material, other uh, communications uh, to make sure you have that. All right, last comments. Please be approachable, all right? This, I think, is a really important part. And, and often students don't, you know, they, it's hard for them. So, you know, be approachable in terms of what you do. Uh, come in with a lot of enthusiasm. Be prepared. Don't mail it in, all right? I've taught Business 1.0 now for five years probably 18 sections, and I've had a few times when I've gotten out there and I've said, man, that sucked. That was flat, it wasn't good, I didn't give it everything that I should have. And I think they deserve it, right? So, you know, you know it'll happen, but just, you know, try to go in with a, with, a, with a positive, enthusiastic attitude. Earn respect first, and then friendship second from the students, okay? I've seen a lot of professors do it the other way, and I don't know, I just don't, I just don't know if that works as well. And, I, and I've seen that in the business world too, where leaders have tried to be friends first and they never get the, the, the professional respect that they need to have with that. So I would say go for the, to me I think it's more important, go for the professional respect first. And then if friendship follows, and what I mean by friendship is somebody who comes in and wants to talk about their careers and you know, work with you and maybe do you know, research with you, whatever, then a friendship could certainly develop from that. Um, at the end of the day, be true to who you are have fun, all right? This is about having fun, I think, for everybody. Make an impact because you're a teacher, right? And our whole job here is to actually make an impact in terms of what we do here. All right, this is what I, how I end all of my class sessions. Takeaways, what did you learn? Anybody in our, our group here? What did you learn today? Anybody? Yes? I love about the team rubric um, because I know I personally hated I'd much rather handle my own assignment when I was a student, and so I haven't imposed that on my own students, but there are some things that it would be better for them to okay, do. Okay, so tool, the team tools would be something you find very helpful. That, yeah, and you said we can uh, email you? Yeah, I'll, 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 put into, I'll put some things into a Dropbox folder and share it with everybody. Yeah. Yes, what else, sir? Yeah. I learned that the syllabus is key, and everything starts with the syllabus. Syllabus starts, with, that's all your intellectual property right there. That's everything that you've come together with from up here into that document. That's going to be something you should just be super proud about, right? That's, that's your whole intellectual knowledge is, is, is put into those 12 pages. <laughs> Whatever, 10 pages. What else? Yes, sir. I have my laptop open, so I've got to be ready to send you my notes. There you go. All right, yes, yeah, so send me your notes. Uh, email me your notes your, 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 to see if you're taking notes or if you're off surfing somewhere else. Yes, sir. I learned I've been feeling 37 hours of class. To give myself a point. <laughs> no, I'm saying, no, I'm saying, you're just filling 37 hours, which is a lot of time, isn't it? Right? It's a lot. It's a lot when you put it that way. What else? Give me, a, give me one to close with. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, but this is this is more important than your your next meeting that you're gonna have, right? Because you can schedule meetings anytime. And I, you know, I've been through it where it's frustration. You start grading, you get to a couple of papers or whatever, and then you, you have that meeting. You know, you got to get into a groove, right? Because you're seeing trends, you're seeing things that you've got to figure out as you're going through the process uh, to allow you to. Know. All right, anybody else? One more. Yes, ma'am. Marie. Audience. 
Excuse me? Knowing your yeah, know your audience, right? They, they are different. There are different mindsets for each of them. And I, that was just one way to categorize them that I see, but there's lots of other data out there on that. But it will help you think about how I would structure my particular presentation. All right, so I think we're out of time here. With that, I hope you guys got, picked up a few pointers, had some fun along the way. Um, I will be happy to... Um... Oh, here's the last thing. I asked you guys to do this at the very beginning, and you want to share your best work. This is like your backup in case, I, in case I went way too fast and I had 10 minutes left in the class. You always have something to fall back on, right? To, to use. Well, we, didn't, we ran out of time, so we couldn't do that. But always have that extra backup just in case you know, you, you come a little bit short on. So continue to dialogue. I'll have to email you guys a Dropbox folder. Would you guys like a copy of one of my syllabuses just to see it? Yeah. Okay. Um, the, the team tools, is that something that would be helpful? Okay. The transcript gone wrong? Yeah. <laughs> okay, anything else? The slides. The slides. Oh, yeah, the slides too. I'll be happy to do those too. Anything else? A chat. A chat? <laughs> yeah, well, I, when I saw I had 100 plus people sign up for this, I was going to offer a money back guarantee for you guys. <laughs> you know, if you didn't like it, so that offer still goes. Okay, great. So, anyway, I hope you had fun. Feel free to reach out to me, my email and stuff. You guys know where it is. You can find it. So, thank you very much. Thanks, Johnny.